So, you know, we've talked so far in the previous couple of sessions about developmental experiences, about attachment and parenting. But going back to that nature nurture debate, is it all about upbringing? Is it all about parenting? You know, which of the stories is correct? Is it the story of Tarzan who was, you know, born in the jungle and then couldn't go back to civilization because the jungle was where he was raised and where he belonged? Or is it the story of Mowgli, right? Who so was also um, raised by wolves in the jungle, but belongs back with his own kind, okay? Because he was really quite helpless on his own in the jungle. Well, in reality, neither of the stories is completely correct, right? In reality, it's a bit of both. We've already talked about the fact that overall, the nature-nurture debate has really come out at a tie, okay? That both the environment and biology contributes to who you are, including antisocial personalities and criminality. Now, even at an early age, there are differences in what we might call biological temperaments. Okay, what I mean by temperament is behavioral patterns. Okay, we usually use the word temperament when talking about children and use the word personality when talking about adults because personality is more complicated. It takes time to develop. Temperament contributes to it, but a whole range of other factors contribute towards personality as well. But even at an early age, some children are more easily soothed, some infants. They respond differently to different, they, they respond differently to the same environment, rather. Some children more easily stressed, some children more positive, some children more sociable. Now, in a longitudinal study, uh, the New York longitudinal study was quite a revolutionary study by Thomas and Chess, in which they observed different infants and came up with three different categories. Okay. The first is the easy child who easily adapts to changes in the environment, changes in routine, who is open to new experiences and is generally pretty cheerful and low in emotionality. Then there is the difficult child who does not react well to changes in the environment or changes in routine. Okay. And they have great emotionality, meaning they cry with intensity. Okay. So they're not easily soothed, okay? And then lastly, the slow to warm up child, who's also a bit moody in temperament, okay? Also not particularly cheerful, but they're less intense in their emotions, okay, than the difficult child. So they also don't really like changes in routine, different experiences, different environments, okay? But their overall temperament is a bit more withdrawn, okay? And less intense. Now, you'll see in the original study, even the researchers could not place all of the infants into one of these categories. A number of the infants could not be clearly placed into any category. And future researchers found it difficult to replicate the, the research design, okay? And in psychology, we've really moved away from categorical approaches to dimensional approaches, right? Seeing things on a continuum rather than putting people in categories. So in 1988, Roy Martin looked at the various dimensions that might be explaining some of the differences in these types. So a dimension to do with adaptability, one to do with emotionality, one to do with shyness, okay? And these personality or temperament, rather, these temperament traits, these temperament dimensions, everyone scores somewhere on, either on the low end, on the high end, somewhere in the middle. But other researchers thought that some of these dimensions were overlapping. And so the temperament model that is most used nowadays is that by Mary Rothbart, which has three dimensions to it. So these are dimensions meaning that every child scores on each of these dimensions, either on the low end, the high end, most near the middle. Now they're very broad dimensions, meaning that they're made up of many characteristics, okay? The first is surgency, extroversion, to do with enthusiasm, positivity, sociability, okay? The second is negative affect, one's propensity for negative emotion, so emotional intensity, but also moodiness, okay? Withdrawing behavior. 
irritability. Okay, these negative emotions would group under this dimension. And then effortful control is really about being able to control one's impulses, being able to keep focused on a particular task without being easily distracted and being persistent on a task as well. Okay. So in terms of how these predict later personality traits, you know, high extroversion obviously predicts high extroversion. High negative affects predicts high neuroticism in the big five model of personality. And high effortful control predicts conscientiousness as a personality trait in the big five model. Okay. Now, there is clearly a strong heritable component to temperament. Okay. Identical twins separated at birth have pretty similar scores in terms of their temperament traits certainly more similar than non-identical twins, okay? Some dimensions of temperament are more genetically influenced than others, okay? So the heritability for negative affect, for example, is higher than the heritability for surgency extroversion, okay? Meaning that negative affect is influenced more by genetics in comparison to extroversion. Extroversion is influenced more by the environment than negative affect in comparison. But even though there's a biological component to temperament, there's still going to be always some influence from the environment. Okay, and we can see numerous examples of this. But for example, if you are raised in a positive environment, okay, then you're more likely to have a positive temperament. Okay. If your um, parents are responsive, more likely to be less emotional. If you grew up with a mother who's clinically depressed, more likely to be fearful in terms of your temperament. But what I want you to keep in mind is the environment and biology are always interacting with one another, okay? Remember, it's not just the case that, you know, one is influencing behavior. There's going to be some relation between both factors. And the goodness of fit model argues that the best social development outcomes come from when one's temperament is congruent with the environment that they're brought up in. Okay, so this means, for example, if by temperament, you're very curious and explorative, then if you're raised in environments in which your parents take you hiking and take you on other adventures, okay, they allow you to, you know, explore, then this is in line with your temperament, okay. But also it means parents should adapt their parenting style somewhat to fit the child's temperament. You know, some children by temperament are much more upset by criticism or discipline. Some are much more sensitive um, by nature, okay? And so it might be the case that, you know, a parent has to slightly adapt their parenting style in comparison to maybe an older sibling who is much less sensitive, okay, in terms of the parent's approach. But all of these factors are always influencing each other, okay? So to give you an example, you know, maybe you have a child whose temperament means that they're very emotional, that they're up all night, really crying with intensity. And then, you know, this is influencing the parents sleeping. It means they're sleep deprived, more irritable, less patient. Maybe that has a negative influence on their relationships, maybe has a negative influence on their job performance. Okay. And maybe it also has a negative impact on healthy parents. Maybe they become more irritated with their child and less patient with their child. Okay. And so it, all of these factors can influence each other, right? And also, of course, if one is losing their job because of these factors, then that might mean they're more depressed and so on as well. Okay. So all of these factors are always in interaction. Okay. Now, Jerome Kagan is the best known researcher in the field of temperament, and he has a number of longitudinal studies that show the stability of temperament. Okay. So, in one example, we have infants who are classed as being fearful, fearless, or average. Okay. We're not really interested in the average for this study. Let's pay attention to the 23% classed as fearful and the 37% classed as fearless. Okay, 
these children are followed up on for 20 years in a longitudinal study. After only seven years, 18% of the fearful children are still classed as fearful, whereas 80% are no longer classed as fearful. But not a single one of the fearful children were ever classed as completely fearless. Okay, So temperament is more of a predisposing factor. It can certainly be moderated, overwritten, perhaps, to an extent. Okay, But it's very, very rare that one goes from one extreme to another extreme. Okay. What we'll talk about when we talk about psychopathy later in the course, we'll talk about the temperament traits early in life that predicts psychopathy in adulthood, okay? And how these children, it's not the case that they can't be socialized, but it's much, much harder to socialize them than it is the typical child, okay? Okay, I went through that fairly quickly, but is there any questions on what I've said there on temperament. A lot of this is laying the foundations, okay, for what we're going to talk about in the future modules. But it's one important influence, of course, in one's development. Another is peer relationships, okay? Now, peer relationships are crucial for a number of reasons. They can help in the growth of social competence, so picking up on social cues and social confidence, how you behave in social situations. They can give a child stimulation, helping in their development, give them companionship, guidance and assistance, especially if it's a child similar in age, okay, you can go through things together, help one another with the experience. And they can give self-validation, so we're getting more psychological now. This could be direct, it could be a compliment, for example, or it could be indirect, the fact that they just want to spend time with you or be your friend, for example, could be validating in itself, right? They also can give emotional support. So even young children are more likely to display brave behavior and explore unknown places if they have a friend to accompany them rather than on their own. And a degree of intimacy, okay? Even young children share secrets, if you like, they tell each other about themselves, even if it's things like favorite color, favorite animal, okay, but from an early age, children begin telling each other about themselves. And they can support in the growth of pro-social behavior, developing empathy, compassion for others, okay, perspective-taking abilities. Now, when looking at how a child is developing socially, what we might be interested in is how socially accepted are they by the peer group, okay, by their classmates? And this is called so sociometric studies, okay, in which we measure social acceptance by the peer group. Now, this could be some sort of basic rating system, like a three-point Likert scale, sad face, neutral face, happy face. How do you feel about this child? Give them a picture and a name, okay? And then everyone rates, okay? How do you feel about this child? Or it could be a nomination system. So tell me which children do you like the most in your class? Tell me which children do you like the least in your class? Okay. So a rating system or a nomination system are the two ways of doing this sort of sociometric research. Now, the results of this research are that there are five categories. Okay. We're only interested though in four of them because the fifth is average where 60% of children fall. Those who are reasonably light, okay? But it's the other four more extreme scores that we're interested in, in terms of differences in developments. So the popular group are those who receive high positive nominations, high positive ratings, right? The class, largely likes them and not really any dislikes, okay? We then have controversial children. This is the smallest group, two to three children in a class at most, who receive a high number of likes and a high number of dislikes, okay? So some children like them, some don't. And then we have the neglected children, okay? Who receive basically zero nominations. They're forgotten by the peer group, okay? They don't get any positive likes or negative dislikes. 
and then the rejected group of children who are largely disliked by their peers, okay, who don't really receive any positive nominations and who receive a large number of negative nominations. So what do these children look like? Okay, those who fall within the popular group are typically very pro-social, cooperative, display empathy and leadership skills, meaning that they lead playtime, they suggest games to play, they explain the rules, they initiate activities, okay. But also if they're late to the game, they're very good at joining in. They can watch for a little while, pick up on the rules of the game, and then enter the game without disrupting the flow, okay. The neglected children are children who are shy, withdrawn, that's likely why they are forgotten by the peer group during the nomination system, right? They often engage in solitary activities, but it's usually undisruptive activities, okay? So, you know, drawing or reading or getting on with schoolwork, okay? It's usually productive in some way. Now, the neglected children, it's not that they don't have social skills or understand social dynamics, because if they're invited into the game, they can actually pick up on the rules very well and they can get on with people very well in the game situation. It's just that they don't initiate games and they won't join without invitation. Okay, they don't really have the confidence, okay, to join a game that's already occurring. They have to wait for someone to invite them. And then the controversial children are those who are pretty energetic and pro-social in many ways, very inclusive, okay, will include everyone in games, make sure everyone's invited to the party and so on, can be very um, good at remembering details about people. So there's good pro-social abilities that, you know, other children respond well to, but they can also perhaps be quite bossy or quite obnoxious. There's something about their temperament that rubs other children the wrong way. And so they're disliked by some children as well. But for the purposes of this class, it's the rejected children that we're most interested in. Okay. These are the children who display very little pro-social behavior, caring for others. Okay. And who display a high amount of overt aggression, which is physical aggression. Okay. So kicking, biting, hitting, and so on, okay? But also a good amount of relational aggression, which is verbal aggression, okay? Which could be name calling, or it could be manipulation, okay? Do this or you're not invited to my party, for example. They often also engage in solitary activities, but it's quite disruptive, okay? It's not productive, and they can be disruptive during class time as well. Okay, often have outbursts, for example. They often have difficulties regulating their emotions. And they also will inject themselves into games. Okay, but unlike the popular children, they're not very good at picking up on the rules. Okay, they will disrupt the flow of the game. Okay. Now, one thing I should maybe say is popular children usually have a large number of friends. They very rarely have one best friend, okay? And actually there are positive development outcomes from having a best friend. You know, best friends fight a lot and they make up a lot. And so it's a good predictor of later good conflict resolution skills, okay? Now, when it comes to rejected children, about half of them have a best friend who's typically another rejected child. And the other half have zero friends at all, okay? So there's going to be a large difference between those two subgroups of rejected children. There's a number of outcomes we can predict from falling within this rejected category. They're more likely to be lonely as they get older, including across the teenage years and beyond more likely to have teenage delinquency, more likely to get into fights at school, be kicked out of school, have school transfers, be suspended, excluded, 
for the girls within this group more likely to have eating disorders in the teenage years, for both boys and girls more likely to abuse substances once they're older, more likely to have suicidal thoughts, more likely also to have suicidal behaviors, more likely to have relationship difficulties. This is in making friends once they're older, it's with their colleagues, it's in romantic relationships, okay, it's broad, and often difficulties in their career as well. <clears throat> There's a distinction to be made as well here, um, two subgroups, okay, within this rejected category. Um, first of all, there are withdrawn rejected who might be disruptive, okay, but they're not overtly aggressive, okay, and this makes up about 10 to 20% of the rejected children. The other 80 to 90% is the aggressive rejected children, okay, those who are overtly aggressive. Now, one common finding within this rejected, aggressive, rejected subgroup is a high amount of hostile attribution bias within the children. Okay. What hostile attribution bias is, is when you give a hostile intent to something that's actually quite ambiguous in nature, okay? So coming, someone's coming towards you and you assume they mean you harm, so you're on the defense. Or people over there are laughing and you assume they're laughing at you, okay? So this could in part be because of insecurities or previous experiences, right? If they've been bullied, for example, then it might make sense that they assume people have ill intent. Or if they come from aggressive households, right? in which there was domestic violence, for example, then it also makes sense that they might over-anticipate the amount of hostile intents that they pick up on in their environment. So it's not hard to imagine why this might play a role in aggressive behavior, right? If you assume that people have hostile intents, they're out to harm you, you're going to be on the defense and you're going to be ready to be reactive, right? You're going to be much easier to provoke, okay? And so we will see more reactive aggression in these children. Let me just say there are interventions that can occur during the school years, okay? The earlier intervention occurs, the more likely it is it will be successful, okay? This could be perspective taking, okay? So this could be, you know, lessening hostile attribution bias or helping with understanding people have different perceptions, okay? It could be social cognition, so improving empathy, okay? Improving um, understanding of social dynamics and social problem solving skills. So, you know, conflict resolution skills, you know, how do you deal with conflict successfully rather than always on the aggressive? By the way, let me say one other thing. Um, the neglected and controversial types are the least stable, okay? Meaning that if we follow up on these children, they may have gone to being average, okay? If the group does change, that's where it typically falls, okay? It's unlikely a neglected children will become controversial or rejected, or a controversial child will become neglected. If it changes, it's usually from one of these to average, okay? But these are the two most likely to change. The popular group and the rejected group are more stable, okay, than the neglected and controversial groups. And as we'll go on to see, it is a fairly stable group once one is in that rejected category, okay? And I'll talk a bit more about this, but, you know, often in the case of school shooters and so on, it's talked about the fact that they were rejected at high school, that they had no friends, that they were bullied and so on. Usually the problem far predates that. Okay, It wasn't that they were just rejected in high school, but they were rejected in elementary. Okay, And they were never really able to catch up on with the social skills and so on that they were neglected from learning because they weren't privy to what was happening within the social group. 
Now, you know this already, but just as a reminder, there's two types of aggression. There is reactive aggression, which is defensive, right? Reactive in response to provocation, a real provocation or an imagined provocation. And then instrumental aggression, the one that's premeditated, cold-blooded, calculating to get a particular goal, okay? So this could be, you know, stealing a child's lunch money or pushing them out of line because you want to get lunch first. Whereas reactive aggression, right, is hitting a kid because you think they're going to hit you, okay? So when it comes to the development of aggression, the signs of aggression actually appear pretty early in life, within the first year, okay? And by 17 months, there's a clear difference between the sexes in overt aggression, okay? Meaning that the males are showing higher signs of overt aggression than the females. So this is at too early a stage for aggression to be purely a product of the environment, okay? There is some biological reason for aggressive tendencies. And two-year-olds display more overt aggression than any other age group. So what that means is if we had a group of one-year-olds, a group of two-year-olds, a group of three-year-olds, a group of four-year-olds, all the way up to 18 years old, and then we coded how much overt aggression we observed in each group, how much kicking, hitting, biting, hitting other children with toys, there would be more signs of overt aggression in the two-year-old group than any other age group, okay? But for most children, they are socialized by the, the ages of three and five, okay? So during this time, overt aggression swiftly declines. They become much less physically aggressive between three and five, okay? And then other types of aggression come into play relational aggression, manipulation, name calling, okay? So what this means is, if we look at the overtly aggressive two-year-olds, we cannot make any predictions based upon how aggressive they are at two years old, okay? Because if we looked at those on the high end, only one out of eight of them would still be aggressive as adolescents, okay? So the vast majority of those who are overtly aggressive at this age are socialized, okay? So we can't make stable predictions from two years of age. But once one gets to five years of age, if they're still physically aggressive, then it becomes much, much more stable, okay? Patterson's model over how antisocial personality develops is still the most the most popular framework for understanding the development of antisocial behavior. And so what this model says is in early childhood, most children are socialized. They're taught it's not okay to hit children with your toys. It's not okay to kick and bite. If you do this, other children won't want to play with you, okay? So through parenting, okay, through discipline, through monitoring, they're socialized, okay? But if they go to school, and most children go to school at around five years of age, right? If they're still physically aggressive, if they haven't been socialized by this point, the peer group will reject them, okay? Because children don't want to play with children who fight and kick and hit and beat you with their toys, okay? So what happens then is if one is still displaying physical aggression once they go to school, showing signs of a conduct disorder, because they're rejected by the peer group, they're not privy to the, the workings of the social group, okay? Understanding social cues, understanding social dynamics, okay? Understanding, you know, social skills and developing social skills. And so they fall behind socially in terms of their development. The consequences of this are that it becomes increasingly harder and harder, okay, to come to the same level as everyone else. Okay, because the the peer group, they're maturing, okay, they're developing social skills and so on, and they're maturing. The re rejected child isn't privy to this, okay, and so as, as they're all getting older, the gap is becoming larger and larger, okay. Eventually, those five-year-old children, right, will be eight-year-old, eight-year-olds, right, and the child who was rejected still has the social skills of a two-year-old, okay. 
And so it becomes such a large gap, it becomes impossible, okay, for the child to come to the same level as everyone else. So this rejection by the peer group oh, then often comes with its academic failure, poor school performance, okay? And eventually commitment to other aggressive peers, okay? And it's then this, according to Patterson, that then predicts delinquency, okay? So that's why I say that, you know, for troublesome teens, the problem usually stems much, much earlier. It wasn't the case that they were rejected in high school, but the case that they were rejected much, much earlier than that, okay? And they never then develops the social skills in order to come in line with everyone else. Any questions so far? Now, like I say, before five years of age, aggression is not a very stable predictor of anything in the future. But once one gets to the school years, once one gets to five years of age, it does then become very stable. And like I say, Patterson says this is because of the role of peer rejection. Now, there's a number of examples. The literature on this is vast. OK, I'm just going to give you a few examples that demonstrate just how stable aggression is once one gets to five years of age. So in one study of 500 boys in Pittsburgh, more than 50 percent of the seven year olds who were classed as highly aggressive had committed some serious act of delinquency okay, by their teenage years by 17. This includes stealing a car, attacking someone with the intent to kill, okay? In a study of 700 Canadian girls, the six-year-olds who were frequently disruptive in class were five times more likely to be diagnosed with a conduct disorder than the children outside this group. Yeah. What's the percentage of people who are afraid of the highly aggressive? Um, well, it would be 80 to 90 percent of the rejected group, which is 10 percent, so it would be like 8 percent of, um, of, of children. Um, a study of 200 German preschool children, um, those judged to be most aggressive as adults 12 times more likely than the least aggressive children to have a criminal conviction. Yeah. One caveat to that, though, by the way, you know, the way these so social economic, so social metric studies are done, there has to be a 10% of rejected children, and there has to be a 5% of controversial children. So it doesn't necessarily mean that in every single class, you know, that full 10% will actually fall within this category. It will apply in some cases more than others. <clears throat> so, you know, what we've covered so far are a large number of risk factors for violence, right? From a neuropsych perspective, situational, developmental. So there are a number of routes for aggression. You know, a difficult temperament from an early age, high testosterone, a deficit in serotonin, a low resting heart rate, frontal lobe dysfunction. Being male makes you more likely to commit violent crimes also than female, than being female. But also the male brain is more vulnerable to toxins during fetal development and abnormal development than the female brain, because the female hormones seem to act as like a buffer, a protector against some of the disruptors to fetal development. A number of environmental contributions, right, that we've looked at, insecure attachment can make one more paranoid and so on. An abusive household, neglect. Parental arguing isn't really one I touched upon, but it certainly does increase the odds of depression and anxiety more than anything else, and to an extent also antisocial behavior. Now, it's normal for parents to argue, of course, but ideally children should view successful conflict, conflict resolution within the home. I'm talking about on an extreme end when parents are always, always fighting, okay, nonstop within the household. Aggressive peers, often in line with rejection from the larger peer group. And media, again, isn't really one I've touched upon, but social psychologists love to study this one. But, you know, there is some correlational studies that look at the fact that violent exposure via the media correlates with more violent tendencies. 
But in forensic psychology, we're not interested in this, okay, because it's never going to be used as a risk factor when it comes to assessing someone's level of risk in a prison, what media they consumed as a child. And then the interaction, okay, between the biology and the environment, right? There's always going to be a correlation between the two, but also, you know, some of these are going to be a consequence of the interaction, right? One might have prefrontal cortex damage that was a result of consistent childhood abuse, right? Persistent head trauma across their development that might then have led to the brain dysfunction. And then we've looked at a number of disruptors to fetal development, right? Which can impair brain development, identified sometimes via some of the physical abnormalities. So this includes malnourishment, lead exposure, smoking during pregnancy, consuming alcohol during pregnancy. So you have your key learning outcomes to go over, and then also some further reading that you can maybe look up if you're interested in this module. You don't have to, it's just out of further interest. Um, there's also a, quite a good movie called The Wave that, that really demonstrates some of the situational risk factors we looked at. And a Netflix documentary called Three Identical Strangers that shows you um, the twin studies that we talked about through another lens that's also pretty interesting.